Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I am the Access Fellow at Jesus College at the University of Oxford. I'm also a tutor in politics at the university. Today we're going to be talking about originality. Are you an original? Can you be original? There are several tips that I will share that can help you be in a more be a more original thinker, but this is more a lecture about well, what even is originality and why is it so highly prized by competitive universities such as Oxford. So to get started, I'm just going to share my screen and wear my special uh, tinted glasses that I have to wear because of my terrible eyesight. Uh, so let's just share my screen so that you can see my slides. Okay, here we go. So are you original? Well, always good time to warm up at the beginning and to think about some examples, some illustrations. When you're trying to define a complicated concept, it's quite a good idea to just work through real world instances and try and see if you can abstract away from that specific to a theoretical or general level. So start by thinking about what's the most original creative thing or idea that you've ever seen or experienced. What gave you that sense of its novelty, of its freshness? Where did that notion come from? And how did you identify it and categorize it in that instant as incredibly original? It might have been a piece of music that you heard for the first time, it might have been something that you read, it might have been a joke that somebody told you. It could be a, a clothing choice that somebody had. There are all sorts of ways in which we can observe or at least think, feel like we are observing something that is creative, original, new. So try and get a sense of how you knew what that was. So give yourself a little time to think about it. Perhaps even pause the video if you like, but just have a good think about what you think of as original and indeed what you think of as the opposite of original, okay? So let's have a think fairly deeply about the definition of originality and whether you can even define it as in make it finite, whether originality is something that can be finitely described or whether it is by definition unidentifiable until you've seen it, if that makes any sense. It is quite difficult to know you've seen something original unless you're very familiar with what's unoriginal or derivative. Well, anyway, let's have a think through some, some famous sort of considerations about originality. This is perhaps one of the most famous proclamations on originality. It's from the, the Bible, no less. And it states that the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is what is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. That, that phrase, there is nothing new under the sun, is commonly cited as, as, if you like, proof that there is nothing original, that it's impossible to be original. And interestingly, this comes from the book of Ecclesiastes uh, 1.9, and this is the King James Bible version of it. So this notion that it's almost impossible to be original. Now, I suppose there is some credibility to this, that given that we are, at least today, on a planet with seven and a half getting on for eight billion human beings, the idea that you could have some completely fresh idea that nobody else has considered, or that you could act on that idea, does seem vanishingly small and unlikely. But of course, we do nonetheless see examples of people being unique and being original. So this statement is also a little bit pessimistic, I would argue, that this notion that it is impossible to do anything new under the sun. And there's loads of evidence of inventions, of discoveries, of ideas that have progressed humanity in a variety of ways that do seem to have originated something. They, they are not purely derived from the past. I suppose it depends on what you take as derivative of something that's come from something else. A lot of original ideas and creative ideas build on existing works. So I suppose in some sense, they are by necessity derived from an existing body of work or an existing body of ideas. But the extent to which they are purely derivative and the extent to which they have originated something else is, I suppose, a matter of degree and quite complicated to determine. Anyway, as mentioned, you can originate an idea, a, a material, a method, a composition. So a composition might be where you take lots of existing and derived things, but you create them together in a new formula could be, for example, an original recipe for a cake. You're, you're using some of the standards of cake making, but you're putting together some unusual ingredients in an unusual way, and you've come up with a brand new composition. There's also a, an interesting notion, which is that originality doesn't necessarily need to be real. It can just be perceived. Sometimes what we say is original is more of an assertion or a contention, and that, that we can have a lively debate about what is or is not original and what is or is not derived. There are some fascinating examples of this in copyright law for which there is a threshold of originality wherein patent lawyers and intellectual property lawyers will try and determine whether or not 
your creation is in fact new enough to be to be uh, considered as such, or whether it is in fact derived. The, the man in the picture here is called John Fogarty. He um, uh, was the lead singer of C Credence Clearwater Revival, huge band uh, in the 1960s. Uh, he split off to launch a solo career and he ultimately got sued in 1988 for sounding too much like himself. In other words, the, the publishers that owned the rights to the Credence Clearwater Revival that catalog sued him in his solo work because his solo work sounded so much like his work with CCR, which is really odd. He was basically being sued for being too derivative of himself. I mean, ultimately the case went nowhere and, uh, and he won in court, um, but it's nonetheless a fascinating case study into this notion of originality and derivation. Um, another example is this one. This is. Uh, an image of the uh, Mona Lisa having been uh, reclaimed after it was stolen. Now, the reason for showing the Mona Lisa is that it's often described as this breathtakingly original contribution to Renaissance art. And it certainly has some decent claims to that. It, it, it's famous for its, uh, for its ambiguous smile and various other sort of features of composition. But perhaps one of the things that sustains its notoriety and fame is because it was stolen. It was stolen at the, in the early 20th century, and that massively increased its value and the interest in the piece of work. To the extent that I wouldn't be surprised if its concurrent fame and fortune and notoriety is in large part derived from the fact that it was stolen. And therefore a lot of people sort of talk up the Mona Lisa as this great contribution to art, but it might be that they are somewhat feeding a myth about it. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that I could paint my piece or anything like that. It's obviously a breathtaking piece of work. But what we need to try and split apart is the extent to which it is original and worthy of praise in itself, or the extent to which it is spoken about that it forms part of a narrative of originality, because lots of people want to talk up its freshness, its boldness, in order to sustain this, this mythology, which is quite common, I think, amongst myth making. And you'll see this a lot in marketing, right? A new product will be splashed across newspapers and, and internet as the, as the next new thing. It's this thing that you've got to have because it's like nothing else before. And of course that is necessary if you want your product, your idea, your service to have this sense of, of a, a unique sales proposition, a USP. But it could be that a lot of that is just hype and it's just good marketing jargon, but it's not real originality. Anyway, something to think about. So um, what about the opposite? What's the antonym of original, of unoriginal, or cliched, customary, derivative, idiomatic? These are various words that you can that could be considered as, as antonymic uh, to, um, and, no, that's the word, <laughs> antonyms to original, unoriginal. Um, have a little think about the ethics of originality. In other words, you know, why should we desire to be different? Is there a moral case to this? Is it, does it somehow improve us or improve society if we are pushing against cliche, idiom, custom, habit? What about the opposite? What if that sort of constant, almost revolutionary spirit of seeking to negate the past and deny or decry conservation could in itself be dangerous. And this is a foundational political dispute. It's one of the most sustained cleavages in politics across the world between those that seek out progress versus those that seek conservation, liberals and progressives versus conservatives in short. It's so uh, well established that we have this notion of left wing and right wing that we associate with it. Left wing and right wing uh, comes from the French revolutionary period when those in the National Assembly that were more in favor of progress and reform would sit on the left of the throne and those more in favor of conservation would sit more to the right, to the right of the throne. So we still have this down to the present day, this sort of battle. And in some contexts it's become a, a an entrenched battle, what many describe as a culture war between the forces of progress and the forces of conservation. So it's a good idea to have a think about the ethics of originality. 
perhaps in some contexts we can see it as fairly uncontroversial that if you are developing new medicines, if you're developing new products that can help grow businesses and can help employ individuals, that it's fairly sort of uncontroversial that that form of progress is desirable. But then others would argue that maybe you are feeding a, a certain sort of uh, a consum consumption lifestyle that is unsustainable given the scarce resources of the planet. So the ethics of originality is really fascinating and worth having a deep think about. I'm, I'm honestly quite ambivalent about it. I have this sense that progress, in at least in terms of our thinking, in terms of our technologies, is a good thing, but I can see the certain downsides to it as well, and it's a complicated old business. Anyway, some of the contributions to the ethics of originality could include uh, people like John Locke, and you can see John Locke's um, uh, memorial, which is here in uh, Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford. Uh, John Locke was a student at Oxford. And one of his great contributions to political philosophy was this idea that you have the right to life, liberty, and, the, and property, and that is derived from a relationship with God in his, in his thinking, insofar as if you own some property, and you develop it. Let's say you own a farm and you, you plow the fields and you sow the seeds and you cultivate the crops and then you yield the harvest and then you sell that harvest. You have mixed your labor with God's gift of abundance and land. And therefore that is a, a sanctified relationship between yourself and God. And it's inviolable to the extent that if another individual tries to steal your land or indeed if a government tries to expropriate your property via taxation or land grabs, that that is uh, an insult to, to God. It's an interesting idea. I mean, certainly in the contemporary world, we wouldn't necessarily mix in the theology of it. We wouldn't necessarily associate God with that sense of if you develop an idea or a product, it is yours and you, you ought to have ownership of it. But we do nonetheless get this sense of, of quite clear ownership and protectiveness about original ideas and about progress um, and about how we can employ our labor in order to make the world a little bit better. So when it comes to sort of the ethics of originality, you get a sense from people like Locke that if you are progressing, if you're making good with the gifts uh, that have been provided to us, then you're doing what is, is God's work effectively. Um, there are others that are concerned that it's almost impossible to be original, that we are trapped in certain mindsets, frameworks, structures, whatever word you want to use, that sort of enclose us and stop us from being original thinkers. Very common to this mindset would be Marxists and what are sort of collectively described as neo-Marxists. So those are people that have adapted the works of Karl Marx into a contemporary context. Some fascinating ideas that Marxists and neo-Marxists deal with are authenticity and what's known as false consciousness, especially those Marxists that have moved away from the more strict economic Marxism of Karl Marx himself into more cultural matters, are interested in this notion of whether or not we can think for ourselves or whether or not we think in patterns that have been habituated by structures of, say, capitalism, for example. So false consciousness might, for example, be this notion that you can't even realize how you are being manipulated by capitalist forces, that they are so ever present and inescapable that you just don't even really reflect on them. You are trapped within that sort of framework of thinking. So, for example, you may feel this overwhelming urge to get the, lo the latest iteration of a smartphone because you're being told by marketers that the, the old smartphone is now obsolete and useless. It, it patently is not useless, but you get this enormous pressure and that pressure builds into this sort of social fashion for change. And so you start to desire the new thing, even though you don't need it, you don't necessarily even want it, you don't know why you want it, but you're being impelled and compelled to, to change, to progress, but it's all for somebody else's benefit. You're not being authentic. You're not thinking about what you want. You are under a degree of false consciousness. I mean, so there are some fairly provocative questions we can ask in relation to this. Do we even dress ourselves of a morning? I mean, that's in the sense of, of course, for most adults, they are able to put their clothes on and therefore 
do the physical act of dressing themselves. But when you put clothes on, you're just doing the final stage of a long series of decisions that got you to that point. Why did you choose to buy those particular clothes? Why do you opt for certain fashion choices? Why, for example, do men in Western countries typically have short hair and, and women typically have longer hair? Not universally, of course, but that's a, that's a sort of custom habit. Do I, for example, choose to wear open collar shirts? Do I choose to have short hair? Do I choose to have this magnificently unoriginal stubble, which is basically what everyone's got at the moment? Do I make these conscious choices or am I somehow feeling under pressure to be fashionable and to fit in? And perhaps there's nothing particularly wrong with that. Maybe as a social species, we ought to be other regarding. We ought to care how other people think. As I say, I'm quite ambivalent. I'm not sure. I think that this is an, an interesting and lively debate. But we need to have a good old think about the pros and cons of progress and consolidation, which is a classic political debate, as old as time, if you like. OK, um, what about some of the drivers, the motors of change, the, the motors of progress? Well, discoveries, of course, are very important. So that could be something that's fortuitous, lucky. You just stumble across a new material, a new resource. Um, but of course, it takes a, a degree of skill to recognize the, the potential of this discovery. So you can be original and you can contribute to mankind's progress if you discover something, but you make good on that discovery. There's a few examples uh, that I'd like to go through. So let's start with glass. Now, the, the first exploitation of glass as a, as a material is not precisely known, but it's, it's often credited to the Roman Empire. Uh, the likelihood is that many people recognize that after a lightning storm on a, on a beach, there would be glass left over because the lightning crashing into the sand heated it so much that it left behind some glass. So there was an, an accidental discovery along those lines. Obviously, we don't know precisely how it was discovered and that some people recognize that, they, that this resource could be exploited. You can see here an example of a drinking vessel uh, that has gladiators embossed into the side of it. And what we understand is that Romans initially used glass in order to show off their drinks, wine most notably, uh, but latterly were able to then exploit it for other purposes that we now use glass for as well, such as windows. Um, of course, these days, glass has a range of crucial uh, functions, including optics, telescopes, um, the cables that, that carry internet um, um, messages and all the rest of it. So glass is an incredibly useful resource that we rely on on a daily, even minute by minute basis. But it was likely discovered as a, as a material by accident. Nonetheless, its exploitation, you could argue, is original. Another example in this uh, instance is colour. Now, this may seem a slightly strange thing to, to consider, but the colour blue is magnificently difficult to manufacture out of natural materials. And that's why pre-Renaissance pre art in, in the West, say sort of images of, of Jesus Christ, for example, would typically have gold leaf in the place of sky. And that was in part because blue pigments were unavailable. They became available when lapis lazuli was mined and exploited in countries such as modern day Afghanistan and was then sent along the Silk Road to Europe. And so some of the earliest examples of the color ultramarine being used to depict skies and seas and all the rest of it come at the earliest in, in about the early 14th century. This is a magnificent example. This is from Giotto, and it is the, the roof of the chapel of uh, Scroveni in uh, Padua, Italy. And it was completed in, the, in about 1305. And it's a, it's a breathtaking example of blue. Um, <laughs> but blue pigments were, were practically unavailable. And even once they became available, they would have been magnificently expensive. Uh, nonetheless, the, the discovery and exploitation of lapis lazuli in Afghanistan massively predates this, this chapel uh, ceiling, but 
once they were sold by traders, the, the potential for progressing art forms was recognized by people of some considerable genius, it would seem. Um, a more contemporary example of a discovery that has progressed humanity in a, in a highly impactful way is the discovery of penicillin. Now, this was discovered in West London by Alexander uh, Fleming uh, when you know, uh, the apocryphal story goes that he, he left some bread out and it became moldy and he recognized that the mold uh, had antibiotic uh, capabilities. The image I'm showing you on the screen here is of Somerville College in Oxford where a, uh, a chemistry fellow tutor of the university called Dorothy Hodgkin uh, spent much of the Second World War using a process called X-ray crystallography to work out the chemical structure of penicillin. So whilst Fleming had discovered penicillin somewhat accidentally, Hodgkin was the person who worked out how it was put together, which was an important step forward because then that allowed for its chemical synthesis that you could isolate the key parts of the penicillium mold that actually does the bacteria killing, <laughs> to put it bluntly, and then you could mass produce it. And she did this, she did that uh, groundbreaking work here in Somerville College. Um, and so the discovery was one point in the story of originating a new uh, source of antibiotics, but it had to be exploited by people that recognized the full potential. So there's this interesting interplay between luck and careful measured exploitation. Okay, um, another sort of common motor for progress is necessity. Necessity after all is said to be the mother of invention. And I've got a number of just intriguing examples again, just to discuss this through. These are some bone needles that are part of the collection at the British Museum. And they are examples of how individuals used to sew clothing in order to make it better fitting. If you think that in the earliest stages of human existence to keep warm, they would have had to use fire or perhaps animal skins if they were available, but those animal skins would not be tailored. They would just be sort of wrapped around until some clever people worked out that you could tailor the, the skins in order to make them better fitting so that they would be closer to your body so that they would trap the air and keep you warmer for longer. And that will have helped humans to exploit hitherto or you know, then before uh, unexploitable environments that would have been too harsh in the winter, too cold. So places like modern day Europe would have been therefore able to be exploited by by early humans. So quite an astonishing piece of invention, which had amazing uh, impact on human progress. Such a humble tool as well, in many ways, just a sewing needle, but it, it's difficult to understate how much, or difficult to overstate how much it must have changed the, the progress of humanity. Um, and progress, of course, uh, via discovery is cumulative. And that in part is going to be thanks to the, the amazing ability of human beings to pass on and transmit knowledge via generations through our facility of language and more recently through our facility of writing as well so that we can record various discoveries and inventions and pass them on to other generations. And things have become quicker and quicker as you can see from this uh, graphic, the stone age uh, trundled along for some sort of 6,000 years, if not longer, then the Bronze Age for, a, for about 2,000 years, and then the Iron Age shorter. And so each sort of eon of progress is get, has become shorter and shorter because of this capacity for us to share ideas, to transmit them, and to, to ensure that there is a collective shared memory of them through multiple generations. Let me put it in, in these terms. The amount of time it took for humanity to progress from the bronze sword to the iron sword was most likely longer than the amount of time it took for humanity to progress from the iron sword to nuclear weapons. So let me repeat that. The amount of time it took to, for us to get from bronze swords to iron swords was longer than it took for us to get from iron swords to nuclear weapons. Now, for many, you might say, well, they ain't progress. You know, we've gone from something that is dangerous to something that is apocalyptically dangerous. But nonetheless, just in sort of raw technological terms, that is a vast increase in pace uh, that we can see, born in large part out of necessity. 
Now, in this image, we can see two actors playing the roles of Samson and Delilah. And it's the character of Delilah that I'm interested in here because this is an actor called Hedy Lamar. And she contributed to the progress of military technologies during the Second World War, again, in pursuit of a, of a necessity. Specifically, there was a need to stop the jamming of um, torpedo frequencies. So once a torpedo was fired, it was often possible for other ships and, and U-boats, etc., to jam the frequency in order to, to stop the torpedo reaching its target. Hedy Lamar uh, was able uh, to come up with a way of allowing the torpedoes to swap frequencies so that they couldn't be jammed. And this frequency swapping, it forms the basis of modern Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. So in response to a perceived need in a military emergency during the Second World War, Hedy Lamar was, was in very large part responsible for us being able to communicate right now, which is an incredible advance for humanity. Um, but again, suggesting that necessity is often the mother of invention. But necessity is such a fascinating concept in itself because it implies a degree of vulnerability that if you need something, it suggests you have a bit of a gap in your life, you are vulnerable. Just as you know, Hedy Lamar perceived that the allied forces were vulnerable in the Second World War, as they were, just as those that sought iron swords in order to fight their enemies would have felt a degree of vulnerability. So just as those that felt cold in the winter felt that they needed bone needles in order to sew more tailored clothing. So necessity implies that you are in you you have a sense of weakness, if you like, which begs the question as to whether or not it's possible to be truly innovative if you're in a position of absolute authority. If you are, say, a market leader in a in a competitive market, is it possible to innovate? Do you need to innovate? You might feel the need to innovate because you're vulnerable to a change a change of guard, if you like, but it might be quite difficult to innovate if you don't have that pressure. I mean, an example that springs to mind is New Coke. Coca-Cola was for a long time the dominant uh, brand of cola and indeed of soft drinks. And it decided to innovate a new Coke flavor, which was a total disaster. Um, many questioned whether it needed to change the recipe and most agreed that it was not an improvement. <laughs> but it could be that the problem that Coke had was that it didn't really have sufficient necessity to pursue that innovation. It wasn't, in short, vulnerable enough. So that sort of drive to change is interesting. Um, the UK has had uh, has contributed a great many innovations in warfare during the 20th and 21st centuries, derived from that vulnerability. So the UK saw its position as the global superpower of the 19th century very quickly challenged uh, to the point that it is now a sort of middle ranking power. And in order to try and sustain some degree of impact on global affairs whilst losing its relative position, the UK came up with a number of military uh, inventions because of that vulnerability. Now, I'm not suggesting that these are examples of praiseworthy inventions. I'm going to leave that over to you to decide what you think of them, but they are nonetheless original ideas. One of which is special forces. So the, the special air service or, or SAS was developed during the Second World War as fleet footed, light armored, uh, small uh, groups of soldiers that would work behind enemy lines. The simple rationale being that Britain couldn't necessarily compete with the German army on a sort of battlefield, as it were, because the German army was dominant. So from that vulnerability, the British military high command developed a model that would suit their relative vulnerability, but could exploit the enemy's own power against itself. Another example is sun shields, which were used to hide um, tanks and, and personnel during the war in North Africa by a so-called magician of warfare called Jasper Masculin he utilized a range of techniques to either hide military uh, um, material or to pretend that it was in a place that it actually wasn't. And sun shields was an example of a, a shield that you would put over a tank to make it look like a, a lorry from the air. 
So again, the vulnerability of the, of the British to face up against the German army in North Africa led to all sorts of fascinating and impactful inventions. Um, jump jets like the Harrier jump jet is another example. The British um, military establishment couldn't afford the long runways that were required on aircraft carriers. So in order to compete, it wanted an aircraft carrier with a very short runway and it utilized not only short takeoff aircraft carriers, which included the rockets to launch the, the aircraft off, but it also developed the Harrier jump jet in order to take off and, uh, and land vertically, basically because it had to save money. So it had to work out a solution given its vulnerabilities and the solution was jump jets. And I'm sure you can come up with multiple other examples. Okay, there is of course the possibility that invention is the mother of necessity. So we're, we're used to the, the formulation that, that necessity is the mother of invention, but what about the other way around? An example could be smartphones. Now, the iPhone, which I'm showing examples of here, developing across a decade, uh, was not the first smartphone, but it was one of the first mass produced and mass marketed smartphones that became, if you like, an, in, an industry standard. And the interesting thing about smartphones is that they're not strictly speaking needed. You know, I remember life before smartphones and we, we survived, <laughs> you know? but I can't easily imagine life as being as comfortable now without a smartphone. So I am very much one of those people that if you give me a spare 30 seconds, I will probably start checking my phone so that I can look at my emails or check up on the news or what have you. And I don't think I'm un, uh, unusual in that regard. And so the invention of smartphones has created a need in us, not only a need for the smartphone itself, but also for all of the services that the smartphone brings. I'm sure many people would find it difficult to live without their devices. Um, it's not because you strictly speaking need the devices, but because the devices have created a need in you, um, which is really interesting. So how about the ways you can cultivate originality. Maybe we can learn from original thinkers such as this man, uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, uh, who's known for having pioneered all sorts of amazing contributions to, to music and opera. Well, let's take a step back. Where does originality come from? What sort of people and what sort of traits in those people tend to contribute to original thinking and original works? Well, fairly predictably, there's going to be a degree of nature and nurture. So let's start off with the nature of it. We can get some sense of the role that genetics plays in original thinking. There is this sort of fairly nebulous notion of a prodigy or a savant, basically someone who is a genius like Mozart. Mozart had a very precocious talent. He was composing uh, pieces of music as a three to four year old. Mathematicians like Gauss were coming up with proofs when he was still a toddler. It's quite astonishing. So these are people that are unusually well equipped to resolving problems and coming up with solutions that most people are incapable of realizing. So that's not something that most of us can aspire to because that's just comes down to blind luck. There are other genetic predispositions, predispositions to highly original thinking. One example of which is synesthesia. And synesthetes such as Pharrell Williams, you can see here, are people that can basically perceive uh, different um, ideas in different formats. It's quite difficult to explain, but one example is that they can, when they hear a sound, they see a color and there's a sort of mixture of different senses, which makes for a much more provocative form of perception. And other examples of musicians with synesthesia would be Billy Joel. And so they have this capacity to be creative because their senses are somehow cross-pollinating ideas for them. It's a really amazing um, attribute uh, to think about and allegedly is very helpful in, in original thinking. Other examples would include autism spectrum disorder where people with autism don't necessarily feel the need to conform to social habits and are often highly skilled at some particular tasks such as memory and recall. Um, so there are people that have certain biological traits that can be helpful. But it seems obvious that in all of those cases described, and many others, there is nurture involved as well. So not only nurture in the sense of a nurturing environment, but also the capacity of those individuals to nurture themselves, in other words, to work hard at it. A great example is Einstein. Now, Einstein's brain was removed at the point of his death 
and was uh, subject to rigorous study. It wasn't supposed to be. He was supposed to be buried with his brain, but the pathologists that performed the autopsy on him at Princeton University decided to take the brain out for the sake of medical science. One hypothesis that they started with was that his brain would be bigger than the average. They wanted to have some sort of physical evidence of genius. So this man was fairly you know, universally regarded as a genius. He had, a, he had contributed a variety of original thoughts to theoretical physics. So surely we should be able to see that genius in the architecture of his brain was the guiding uh, hypothesis. Now, one thing they noticed fairly quickly was that the brain did not weigh more than an average brain. In fact, it weighed marginally less than an average brain after, after an autopsy. But it did seem to have more glial cells. Now, there are a variety of different brain cells. The more familiar one to most of us are neurons, but there are also other cells which can, can effectively be grown and these are called glial cells and they can help make connections in the brain uh, and therefore can allow you to come up with thoughts that other people may struggle to come up with. Um, but the interesting implication is that effectively Einstein developed them a bit like developing muscle mass. He grew the cells just through commitment and hard work. It wasn't that he was just lucky enough to have uh, that capability, he, he developed it. Another example, and this one's not uh, unique to Einstein by any means, is what's shaded in red here is called an omega fold. And this is, uh, this is something that has been found in many people like Einstein who are exceptionally good at the violin. Now, if you are a right-handed violin player, you will have to use your left hand in order to create the, the necessary chords. And the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and vice versa. And this omega fold is developed by the perpetual use of your left hand in this manner. And so he grew an extra sort of flap of brain, if you like. I mean, there are some other sort of relatively unusual traits of Einstein's brain, one of which is seemingly more connections across the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is, is a, is a uh, bit of the brain that connects the two hemispheres together and it goes basically down the middle and his corpus callosum seemed to have more connections in it than other human beings. So basically Einstein's brain wasn't bigger than average, but it did have more capabilities seemingly physically present and observable in the brain tissue itself, which is truly amazing. But it seems that not only was Einstein likely born a relative genius, but he worked at it. Um, another example in, in that vein are the Beatles. Um, the Beatles obviously had some sort of native talent, if you like, but they worked incredibly hard. And specific Beatles like uh, Paul McCartney also came from a relatively musical background. So his father used to play uh, a number of instruments. But they did what uh, we would describe as their 10,000 hours. So it's often said that to master a skill, you need to do 10,000 hours of practice. And the Beatles absolutely did that before they became the superstars of the early 1960s. They did an extraordinarily grueling uh, training regime where they played night after night concerts, in, in particular in cities like Hamburg and Germany, where they really cut their teeth. And they used to have to take uh, pills in order to just stay awake. They were working so hard. So there's no question that they had raw talent. And in the case of Paul McCartney, also a supportive musical household but they absolutely just put the work in and you can't really take that away from them this idea that they just accidentally became incredibly original superstars would just be desperately unfair they really worked very hard for it some would say well another thing that the beatles used to help with their original thinking was was chemical uh was chemistry and i've already mentioned sleeping pills to sort of what well, uh, the opposite of sleeping pills but speed to keep them awake in hamburg but of course, latterly in the Beatles career, they're associated with other uh, chemical stimulants to originality, should we say, most notably um, LSD, which is a hallucinogenic uh, drug. Now, the big problem with 
saying that LSD created their originality is that LSD works on the brain that's there fairly obviously. So if you don't have that creative capability in the brain that you have cultivated through hard work and consideration, then the LSD is not going to bring it out to you. Okay, so people that don't necessarily have the same degree of of original thinking capability when they take LSD, they're not going to become the Beatles afterwards. So this idea that LSD created things like the Sgt. Pepper album seems to my mind unlikely. Uh, and what seems more plausible with the case of the Beatles is that they worked magnificently hard at their craft. Okay, so what sort of conclusions can we come up with? Well, first of all, you know, why do universities like Oxford value originality? So when I'm interviewing students for Oxford, I look for the raw capacity for independent thought. In short, I'm looking for original thinkers. I'm not looking for derivative thinkers because thinking in a derivative way, in some senses is fairly easy that you can basically just copy what someone else has come up with as a solution to a problem rather than thinking about it for yourself carefully. We like it because I suppose we have maybe unconsciously accepted that progress is a good thing, but you know, I, I hope that I've made clear that that ethical debate about the, the tension between progress and consolidation is worth thinking about carefully. Nonetheless, of course, universities are in the business of generating knowledge and contributing to the improvement of humanity. And so progress seems relatively uh, unambiguously important, at least in, in the context of a university. So that's why we like original thinkers, because we want people to challenge us and we want people to help us develop solutions to mankind's problems. And that comes through thinking for yourself and helping us come up with creative solutions to long-standing problems. How do we therefore measure originality? Well, we look for your academic potential through a range of data, but in particular, the interview, the interview, the Oxford interview is one of the best means for measuring someone's capacity for original thought. And so what we're looking for is if we ask you a question, a difficult academic question, we don't just want to see somebody that will trot out a well-established answer to that or seek to burrow in their in their bag of knowledge for something that could maybe uncomfortably fit it we're looking for someone who can go and think about it for themselves and they may not come up with the best solution to the problem but that's okay because we can help develop that raw capability and that will to think independently into something more powerful but we need to see in the interview that desire to speak for yourself. What we commonly see, however, in interviews is that people are desperate to just demonstrate how much stuff they know, how much, how many things they've read, and therefore they are being incredibly derivative in their thought processes. We'd be much more interested in somebody that was able to demonstrate their own thinking on a problem. And this would include interviews for subjects like mathematics and physics, where you will be offered a, a, a mathematical puzzle that could be incredibly difficult, if not totally impossible to resolve. And so the admissions tutors are trying to, to test your intuitions, to, to use the tools of maths that you've got available in order to resolve these really knotty problems. What you won't easily be able to do is to just utilize a solution that someone's already come up with to solve those problems, because in, in all likelihood, it won't be available or it won't be known to you. So the idea is to push you to think for yourself, even in subjects where you might think that creativity is less important. Okay, so what can you do to cultivate this original thinking? Well, you can do your homework, study other original thinkers. So reading academic publications is a good start. If you go to a website like Google Scholar, so if you go to Google and you Google Google Scholar, <laughs> you'll get a new search bar which uh, comes up and in that you can type in uh, any search terms that you're interested in, and it'll come up with a huge list of academic publications. Academic publications are almost by definition going to be an original contribution to thought. They will often explain what existing literature on a particular puzzle has said, but then there will be some sort of unique contribution. For the most part, that's the only way to get published is to say something fresh and new. And so you can see how other people have done it at a university level. 
and you can start to notice the patterns by which we can be original thinkers. If you, again, look at some of the most important contributors to original thought in a variety of different disciplines, a lot of the time they have obtained their capabilities through years of study and practice and hard work and knowing what other people have done in order to be exceptional. So you need to do something similar. Like the Beatles, it's not a good, it's not a good idea, it's not a bad idea to start working towards your 10,000 hours. Now, you know, 10,000 hours is a lot, but just practicing your craft and trying consistently to keep up the momentum is a good idea because your skills will come with perseverance and it will come with a degree of fits and starts. It's not at all uh, unlikely that you will experience certain failures along the way or certain setbacks. But if you persevere, then you will likely see returns on that investment of time. It's not just a question of natural gifts. Most people that are exceptional thinkers do so through perseverance and hard work, not just through luck and biology. Okay. Another tip I have is to sweat the small stuff. Take care over details. Something that another thing that creative and original thinkers tend to have in common is that they don't just sort of lazily work at the surface level. They really dive to the depths of a problem and they think about all of its elements in, in great detail and with great care. And that is an important way to be creative as well. Going back to the point I was making about interviews, if you want to make sure that you stand out at an interview, a good way to start is by paying very, very close attention to the question you've been asked. A lot of the time in interviews, when I ask a question, students will answer a subtly different question. They'll just drift off the point or they'll work very sort of superficially at the surface of the question without really carefully thinking about all of the words that I've used to put that question together and sweating the small details. That's the way often to stand out and to be creative is to be disciplined and be uh, careful with details. Okay. And another tip you can use is to cross pollinate, to try and think about how other disciplines of, uh, relative to your own have tried to solve similar problems. So for example, in studies of literature, it's becoming increasingly common to utilize computer science techniques. Computer scientists have become highly adept at analyzing language. They have to do so for things like search engines. And so literary scholars have noticed that and have started to use similar mathematical and computer science techniques to try and glean certain insights from their, from, for their discipline from computer science. And this sort of approach to cross-pollination is quite common. So keep an open mind. It could be that some of the solutions that you're looking for to a particular puzzle in your area of interest could come from somewhere else. There could be other disciplines that are thinking about similar things or, or using methods that could be exploited for your own purposes. That's the way I've tried to conduct my own research in politics. I'm interested in the politics of language. So I've looked at what, what are literary scholars doing? What are computer scientists doing? What are lawyers doing? There are lots of other people that are working in tremendously creative ways that can help you be creative as well. Okay, well, I hope that's been interesting and helpful. Thank you so much for watching. Do let me know if you have any comments and otherwise I'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot, bye.